Well, and wow. I mean, if ever any of you ever doubted that dreams can come true, I offer tonight as proof that they can. You know, I have to tell you, the very first time that I met Mary Ann was a few years ago when she was running for Congress, and I came to New York specifically to attend a fundraiser that she was hosting at Town Hall. And so I go, and I have this strategy of being really early for the meet and greet portion, because I know you New Yorkers like to be fashionably late. And so I thought that if I showed up early, that I would have the opportunity to talk to her one-on-one. -on -one. Well, as it turns out, Everyone else in Manhattan had the same idea because I get there and there's this hurricane of people and Marianne's in the center. And I'm about five layers deep, okay? So I'm standing there and I'm looking at my watch and I'm like waiting and I'm waiting. And I know that the program is going to start and she's going to have to go. So I pull out my phone and I say to the person in front of me, I just want a picture. And so she's like, okay, go ahead. So I step in front of her, and there's a guy, and I'm like, I just want a picture. And so he get in front. And so eventually I feel like Moses because the whole crowd parts, and I'm face to face with Marianne, and I freeze. And the only thing that I could think to say was, I just want a picture. <laughs> so I get a picture, and the whole interaction took about like 2.4 seconds. But like we do today, the first thing I did was I put that picture up online, whereupon all of my friends were like, you got to hang out with Marianne Williamson? That's so cool, no way. And I'm like, well, that's what I do in New York. <laughs> Just so not what I do in New York, actually. Um, but I'll never forget, because the caption of that photo was, I don't have heroes lightly, and this happened tonight. And like many of you, I'm sure, it is not enough just to say that I've been a fan of Marianne's work. I have been profoundly impacted by her approach to A Course in Miracles. And at the risk of gush gushing, which I would never do, what I love most about Marianne is that she consistently and lovingly encourages us all to live from a deeper place of real spiritual maturity. And I can honestly say that her example is what truly kick-started my own journey into the course. Because I looked at Mary Ann and I said, I want some of that. <laughs> like, I'll have what she's having. And so from our first interaction to this, needless to say, has been pretty overwhelming. But Marianne, I just want to say personally to you that it is an honor to have your beautiful words as the foreword to Miracles at Work, and it is a true privilege to be here with you this evening. Thank you. I will take my opportunity to gush about you afterwards. Thank you. I still don't have heroes lightly, and this woman is still one of them. So I have about 10 minutes to condense the book that we're celebrating tonight into a few key takeaways that I hope will help you with your own career path. And then Mariana and I are going to move into a conversation. And 15 minutes is not, or 10 to 15 minutes is not a lot of time to attempt to break down a book, much less a book that attempts to break down the course. But it is enough time to distill something for you that has taken me over a decade to learn. And it's something that comes more and more into focus for me every day. The thing is, I write about careers, and so far all of my books have been about this topic because I view work as a source of personal empowerment. You know, they say money can't buy happiness, and that is true, but it can buy a certain amount of freedom on the physical plane, and that's always been a driver for me, particularly as it relates to women. You know, earn enough of your own money so that you have the freedom to walk away from any situation that doesn't serve you. That is a message that hits very close to home for me, and I can only assume that it hits close to home for many of you as well. But somewhere along the way, I think we have lost the plot when it comes to empowerment. Somewhere along the way, particularly as it relates to our career, empowerment has become not a means to an end, but the end in itself, and worse, it's an end that has the result of puffing up the self. 
So this is when our careers become the source of our identity and the source of our accomplishments and the source of our worth. And when that happens, our spiritual path, to the extent that it still exists, gets narrowed down to one piece in the pie of life versus being the container of the pie. And by that, I mean the foundation that holds everything that you are. Here's a question to consider. How much of the spiritual messaging we see every day would have our path become, quite literally, the thing that we walk on simply to become empowered? If we're honest, how much of our seeking is driven not to know God, but to know the peace of God so that we can pursue our own desires in the world? When it comes to our careers, it's sort of baked into the culture now that the goal is to find greatness that the goal is to step into our power, that the goal is to get out of our comfort zone and stop playing small. We hear this all the time as it relates to our work, don't we? The problem, however, is that when we're running as fast as we can towards that elusive goal of stepping into our power, we usually forget to stop and ask ourselves whether that is indeed the right goal to have. We think that in our career, if we don't make it happen, as Marianne said, then nothing is going to happen. And so we get into this habit of chasing and pushing and grasping because that feels like the safe thing to do because that's what feels like control. But as we know, so much of our lives is outside of our control. And so if the only lifesaver that we're clinging to is a desire to be great as the waves of the world bat us around, then of course the result is going to be that our thinking is chaotic and our behavior is erratic. Needless to say, this is not what will make you great or more influential at work. And so what happens is in our grand attempts to quote unquote stop playing small, Ironically, that's exactly what we do. And so what I offer you tonight within the pages of Miracles at Work is the same thing that A Course in Miracles offers, and that's a better way. It's a way where careers and spirituality not only can merge, but must merge. Because while your career will always tell you that there's another rung in the ladder to climb and another goal to pursue, a solid spiritual grounding balances that drive by teaching you that being powerful beyond measure is your natural inheritance. So from a spiritual perspective, you will never be more powerful than you are sitting in this room tonight. We are very accustomed to separating these parts of our lives, but one of the contributions that I hope Miracles at Work makes to this conversation is how we can be both more professional on our spiritual path and more spiritual on our professional path. But in order to do this well, our spiritual practice has to move from the sidelines where it's marginalized into this thing that we do because we want to be at peace while we pursue our goals in the world to right in the center where it becomes the, folk, the filter for everything. And so what does that look like? In the course, it's pretty simple in theory and profoundly difficult in application. Because in the course, the way you bring your spiritual practice to work is that whenever you interact with anyone, you remember that it's a holy encounter. There's a beautiful quote in the book that says, as you see him, you will see yourself. As you treat him, you will treat yourself. As you think of him, you will think of yourself. Never forget this, for in him you will find yourself or lose sight of yourself. The him referred to here is not God, by the way. It's everyone, all of us. That's what makes the course so practical. It takes our spiritual path from this one-sided, vertical relationship where we're either staring up at the sky or staring down at the ground and makes it horizontal by literally putting God right in the eyes of everyone we meet. As you see her, you will see yourself. As you treat her, you will treat yourself. As you think of her, you will think of yourself. Never forget this, for in her, you will find yourself or lose sight of yourself. What this means is that stepping into your power from a course perspective is stepping into your ability 
to see the inherent and unconditional worth that exists in everyone. And as you see that worth in everyone, you know that you are worthy too. Spiritually speaking, that is your greatness. And that's what it means to be empowered. Because that's grace. You're not running around trying to control everything and make your career happen. You're allowing it to happen as the natural result of viewing every interaction you have with every person you meet as an opportunity for a holy encounter without stopping to analyze whether or not they deserve it. Embodying this kind of grace will result in more influence at work, but it's not because you aspired to influence. It's because you aspired to a higher perception. And with all the division that we see everywhere, doesn't a higher perspective and perception of grace, where every encounter is holy, feel like not only what is needed from us right now, but what is demanded of us right now? That is how you create miracles at work and beyond. I mentioned in the beginning of my remarks that there was a lesson in my career that had taken me 10 years to learn, and it's this. The funny thing about grace is that the more you push, the more elusive it becomes. Grace isn't empowered. In fact, most of the time, it's a pretty cold and broken hallelujah. But it's also the most beautiful thing about us because it is the truest thing about us. And to see it, we just have to return to the vision that allows us to see it. Or as someone in this room rather famously said, we just have to return to love. So I know we're going to talk a lot more about this in our Q&A, but just to close here, I'd like to read the last um, couple paragraphs of Miracles at Work. And I also want to take this opportunity to say thank you to ABC Home for hosting us tonight. Tayana, Sarah, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank my publisher, Sounds True, for co-sponsoring this just magical event. Um, Tammy, Haven, Wendy, Christine, Sarah, Jennifer, Sheridan, it is such a joy to be part of your family if you're watching. And last but not least, I want to say thank you to um, Robert Perry, who is the editor of the new um, complete and annotated edition of A Course in Miracles, um, for being my dear friend, for being my mentor on this journey, and my first true course companion. And now I give you Miracles at Work. Miracle workers are love's teachers. They don't announce themselves as what they are, and their voices are not shouting to be heard. But they are around you now, and you'll know them by their frequent smile, quiet eyes, serene forehead, and approach to the world that, quote, is not here, although it seems to be. By answering the call, miracle workers share what they have learned. They do not force a spiritual discussion, but they do hold space for it, because they know only spirit can transform the heart. Their words teach of love, and their presence is an invitation to walk in the lighted footsteps of forgiveness. Today, each moment in fact, there is a renewed call for teachers. Listen in your office now and you can hear it. Every turbulent conversation, every impatient exchange, even the most trivial sideways glance carries within it an appeal for love that is hidden to everyone except the miracle workers. They are the ones who have the spiritual vision that enables them to answer these appeals by extending love while ignoring fear. Previously, I mentioned that this is a superpower at work, which means that love's teachers are true superheroes. Indeed, they may not be faster than a speeding bullet, but they have the power to save the world nonetheless. You have it too, but only if you join love's messengers by standing in the fullness of your magnitude and rejecting all littleness. If you're ready, you can start this instant. There are no verses to memorize, no rituals to attend, and no one you need to recruit. All you have to do is to happily accept your role as a miracle worker is to bring your own thoughts of separation, judgment, hurt, worry, comparison, attack, and scarcity to the Holy Spirit and allow them to be transformed into forgiveness. Nothing more. You don't need to change careers and you certainly won't need a cape to rescue yourself or anyone else from the ego. Your presence is the alternative. So don't wait until tomorrow to be the joyful, wise, and compassionate leader that you are here to be. 
accept the call to be a miracle worker now, not just for your own sake, but for the sake of those around you whose own magnitude has been abandoned for far too long. They will know the truth about themselves as they see this light in you and in others. And after all the illusions of separation vanish, leaving love and love alone, then you will know that this is your true career. Thank you.